Audible Studios presents Skovoroda's Fables, written by Gregory Skovoroda, narrated by Ben Onukwe. Do not belittle fables, my friend. There is nothing funnier than a smart look with a shallow inside, and nothing more joyful than a funny face with hidden seriousness. Remember the saying, the glory of a house is in its hospitality. I myself do not like the changing mask of people and things, which can be conveyed in the old saying, it thumps, it grunts, it rattles. But what is it? Is it the dead head of a mare rolling? This refers to those who talk with eloquence, but do not heed good advice. I do not love this empty pride. Conversely, I love it when there is nothing to the outside appearance, but something inside. The truth is not outside, but inside. Oh, my friends, do not belittle fables. Fables and parables are one and the same. These metaphorical stories were familiar even to the most revered ancient philosophers. Evergreen laurel stays green in winter, in the same way wise people are consistent in their wisdom and telling of the truth. Gregory Skovoroda the Little Goat and the Wolf Flautist One day a little goat strayed from his flock when suddenly he saw a wolf running out of the forest. At first the goat bolted in another direction, looking to escape, but after some time he stopped and turned to the wolf. I know that I can't escape death from your jaws, so be merciful. But before you take me, would you do me a favor? Please play this flute to announce my death. Let me say goodbye to my dear life and enjoy my last precious moments with the sound of sweet music. I didn't know I had this ability, thought the wolf. He took the flute and blew a fine melody. Upon hearing the tune, the goat began dancing. The wolf became lost in his own music, playing smoothly and praising the goat. Then suddenly a pack of dogs appeared like a whirlwind, surrounding them. Startled, the flute fell from the wolf's paws. The dogs leapt onto him, clawing and biting him. The wolf flautist was invited to the dance. Charlie grabbed the wolf's lower back, and Snow in Rover bit down on his neck. Fluffy and Scrappy darted about like rising tornadoes, waiting for an opportunity to strike. The whole valley seemed suspended in motion when witnessing such a shameful disturbance of the peace. At once, bounding out of nowhere, there came Lassie, who joined in on the action and leapt right in. Beaten, the wolf collapsed and sighed. Why did I, a fool? become a flautist, having been born only a master of cows. Because of this goat, I will end up in a frying pan, not in a music school. Ha <laughs> ha, that serves him right, said the little goat. The dogs continued to attack him, and that is how the rascal met his sudden death. Moral. Do not accept what is not given by God. Without God, as they say, there is no purpose. Dogs In one village, in one house, there lived two dogs. One day a stranger passed by, and one of the dogs leapt up and barked until the stranger was out of sight. When the dog was sure the stranger was gone for good, it returned to the garden and joined his companion. What good was all that barking for you? The wise dog asked. Well, at least I cured my boredom. 
the hot-tempered dog replied. But not all passers-by should be treated like enemies, said the wise dog. They mean no harm to our master, and if they did, I myself would not ignore my duty, even though I was injured in my encounter with the wolf's teeth last night. Being a dog is a good thing. But barking at everyone in vain is bad. Moral A smart person knows when to speak, but a fool blethers to no avail. The Crow and the Siskin Not far from the lake, where frogs could be seen, a siskin was sitting on a branch and singing. The crow was nearby and cawed to itself. And seeing that the siskin did not stop singing, she said, Why are you coming here, ugly frog? Why are you calling me a frog? the siskin asked. Because, siskin, you're as green as that frog over there. Oh, the siskin shouted. Well, if I'm a frog, then you're a real toad, judging by your syrinx, which makes your singing very much like a toad's. Moral. One's heart and actions, not external signs, indicate who is who, for every tree is known by its own fruit. Two larks. Back in ancient times when eagles had taught turtles to fly, a young lark sat not far from the place where one such turtle resided. The turtle had finished its flight and descended on a rock with a great rumble. The young lark, trembling with fright, said to his father, Daddy, an eagle must have landed near that mountain over there. You once told me that the eagle is the strongest and the scariest bird. Why do you think that, son? The old lark asked. Daddy, when he was landing... He came at such a speed and made such a noise that I have never seen or heard. My dear son, said the old lark, you are so young. Learn this saying and sing it to yourself. It is not an eagle that flies, but one that lands quietly. Moral. Those who ignore their nature when starting big deeds, will fail in their endeavours. The Head and the Torso The torso, dressed in a magnificent outfit with expensive decorations, boasted to the head, and reproached it for not acknowledging even a tenth of its extravagance. Listen, you fool, the head said, if there is any wisdom in your belly, then it must be blinded by your pride, because you cannot be satisfied with small things, while I can. Moral. Those who trade their honour for luxury and wealth are blinded by their own pride. The Siskin and the Goldfinch The Siskin, having flown out into the wild, met up with his old friend, the Goldfinch. The Siskin asked, I heard you managed to free yourself, my friend, but I see now you are caged again. Tell me what happened. It was a strange incident. The cage dweller replied, A rich Turk came with a messenger to our city, and, walking around the bazaar, they went to the pet market. When there the Turk saw the owner had about four hundred goldfinches captive in hanging cages. The Turk looked at us solemnly as we sang, trying to outperform each other. Then the Turk asked our owner, how much money for all four hundred goldfinches? Twenty-five roubles, the owner said. Then the Turk, without saying a word, paid the money. 
He took cage after cage and released us into the wild, and we rejoiced as we flew in all directions. And what lured you back into captivity? asked the Siskin. Sweet food and a nice cage, the bird replied, feeling somewhat lucky about his circumstances. And now, while I live, I will thank God with this song. It's better to have dry bread and water than sugar and trouble. Moral Those who do not like trouble must learn to live simply and modestly. Better a cracker with water than sugar with trouble. The Cogs of the Clock Inside the clock, one cog asked the other, Tell me, why do you not turn in the same direction as me, but in the opposite direction? This was the will of my creator, and not only do I not interfere with this, but I also help you so that our clock runs according to the Earth's rotation. Moral There are different ways of life for different people, but they all share one common purpose, to live a life of integrity, peace and love. The Eagle and the Magpie the magpie asked the eagle, Tell me, how is it that you don't get tired of swirling around in the vast heavenly heights day after day? You fly up and down as if on a twisted staircase. I would never have come down to the earth, the eagle replied, if my tiredness hadn't forced me to do so. Still, if I were an eagle, I would never fly away from the town said the magpie, and I would do the same too, if I were a magpie, the eagle replied. Moral, those who are born to enjoy freedom and solace are more likely to live in fields, groves and gardens than in cities and towns. The Ant and the Pig A pig and an ant were arguing about which of the two of them was the richest. An ox happened to be a witness to the debate and was appointed as judge of the affair. Do you have a lot of bread? The pig asked with a proud laugh. Please answer, dear lady. I have a whole handful of the purest grain, the ant replied, and as soon as she was silent, the pig and the ox laughed with all their might. So let Mr. Ox be our judge, said the pig. He's been a great judge for more than twenty years. It can be said that among all his brethren, he's the wittiest judge, and he's also very good at mathematics and algebra. Yes, and he is also an outstanding judge in Latin disputes. After these words were said by the wise animal, the ox started counting and calculating. If the poor ant has only one handful of grain, as she herself admitted voluntarily, and does not use anything but grain, and Mrs. Pig, on the contrary, has a whole tub of three hundred and thirty handfuls, then according to all the rules of common sense, that's not what you should have counted, Mr. Ox, the ant interrupted. Put on your glasses and count the expenses against the income. The case was adjourned, and it was transferred to the Supreme Court. Moral. What is enough for your needs is not small. Sufficiency and wealth are the same things. Two Chickens It once happened that a wild chicken met a domestic one. How do you live in the woods, sister? The domestic chicken asked. As well as other forest birds, said the wild one. The same god who feeds a flock of wild pigeons feeds me too. 
but they can fly well, the domestic one said. You are right, said the wild one, and I fly by the same air and am happy with the wings that God gave me. But I'll never believe that, sister, said the domestic chicken, because I myself can only fly to that barn over there. I will not contradict you, said the wild one, but my dear, consider that from a young age, as soon as you were born, you were destined to rake manure in the yard, and I practice flying day after day. Moral. Many people, when they are unable to do something themselves, do not believe that others are capable. There are many who, having pampered themselves too much, have forgotten how to walk. It is also clear that practice without natural inclination is done so in vain, and yet that same natural inclination is complemented by hard work. Why know how things work when you're not capable of demonstrating that knowledge? It is not difficult to learn, but it's difficult to practice. Learning and habit are the same things. They're born not out of knowledge, but of action. Knowledge without hard work is wasteful, as is hard work without nature. That's how knowledge and learning differ. The Knife and the Whetstone A knife once spoke to a whetstone and said, Certainly you mustn't like us knives, brother, if you don't want to enter our camp and become one of us. If I were not fit to sharpen, said the stone, I still would not have dared to take your advice, nor would I accept your fate. I don't want to be like you, and that means I like you very much. I know that if I were to become a knife, I would never cut as much alone as all the knives and swords that I will sharpen during my lifetime. In our time, we whetstones are in big demand. Moral They come into the world, those who enter military service, so that others can be freely encouraged to live a virtuous life. The Eagle and the Turtle An eagle was sitting on an oak tree that was leaning over the water. Beneath it, a turtle was lying down, and it began preaching to its neighbour. Damn that flying! Our late great-grandmother, God grant her the kingdom of heaven, disappeared forever, as we know from the legends. She began to study this damned science with the eagle, a science which Satan himself invented. Listen, you fool, the eagle interrupted her sermon. Your wise great-grandmother did not die because she flew, but because it wasn't in her nature to do so. Flying is as good as crawling. Moral Vanity and pleasure have lured many into circumstances contrary to their nature, and the greater the temptation, the more detrimental the condition. The Owl and the thrush. As soon as the birds saw the owl, they started pecking at her. Does it not upset you, madam? The thrush asked her, that it is not your fault that you are being attacked. Isn't that strange? It is no surprise to me, said the owl. They do the same thing among themselves, and as for the grief, I put up with it because even though magpies, crows, and rooks pinch me, the eagle and the owl do not. Moral It is better to be loved and respected by one smart and good-natured person than by a thousand fools. The Snake and the Toad When the snake shed its skin in spring, the toad saw it and was concerned. How young you are! he exclaimed in surprise. What's the reason? Please tell me. I'll be happy to tell you my secret, the snake said. Come with me. 
and she led the toad to the narrow crevice through which she had slithered and torn off all her old rags. Here, Mr. Toad, please crawl through this narrow passageway. As soon as you get through, you will be rejuvenated, leaving all your excess behind. What are you trying to do to me? I'll get stuck, the toad shouted. Even if I'm lucky enough to slip through there, I'll be skinned. Please do not be angry, said the snake. There is no other way to access where I have been. Moral. He who reaps must sow. Frogs When the lake dried up, the frogs swam in search of new life. At once everyone shouted, Oh, what a magnificent lake! It will be our home forever! Then they plunged into it. But I, said one of them, intend to live in one of those springs that fill your lake. I see a hill far, far away, sending many streams here. There I will try to find the source for myself. Why is that, auntie? A young frog asked. My dear, these streams may one day run in another direction, and your lake, you see, will dry up again. The source is always more reliable than the puddle. Moral All abundance can dry up like a lake, but an honest craft is an inexhaustible source and makes for safe living. Many rich people become poor every day. In such a shipwreck, the only vessel exists in the mind of the shipwright. Even the poorest slaves are descended from ancestors who live in a state of great wealth. No wonder Plato said, Every king springs from a race of slaves, and every slave has kings among his ancestors. This happens when the lord of everything, time, destroys abundance. So know in your head and feel in your heart that to live a decent life is based on the law of faith and the fear of God. This is the source that gives rise to the streams of all civilized societies. The Dog and the Mare The mare, trained to carry loads, swaggered beyond measure. She disliked Mercury terribly, that was the dog's name, and wishing him dead, threatened to strike him with her hind hooves at every opportunity. What have I done so wrong, Mrs. Diana? The dog said to the mare. Why do you hate me so much? You are a scoundrel. As soon as I start carrying my loads in front of guests, you laugh the loudest. Is my toil funny to you? Forgive me, madam. I will not hide this natural flaw of mine, this flaw in which even an ordinary situation seems hilarious to me. Son of a dock, why are you so proud of nature? You're ignorant. Don't you know I studied in Paris? Or do you understand when scientists say art excels nature? Where did you learn and from whom? Madam, if you were taught by the famous Pythicus, the word is Greek, it means a monkey or ape of a tall genus and stature. Then our Heavenly Father taught me, giving me an inclination to this, a will to match it, and the knowledge and habit. Maybe that's why my affliction is not funny, but commendable. Diana, unable to stand it, was about to kick the dog, but by that time he was gone. Moral Making your way without nature is like walking without a road. The further you go, the more you wander. Nature is an eternal source of will. A life without this will, according to the proverb, is worse than captivity. It encourages frequent experience, and experience is the father of art, 
knowledge, and habit. From here, all the sciences, books, and crafts were born. This faithful tutor teaches birds to fly and fish to swim. There is a wise Ukrainian saying, Without God, don't pass the threshold, but with him, it's safe to cross the open sea. The bat, two chicks, and the turtle dove, and pigeon's sons. The great mole, a large burrowing animal, wrote an eloquent letter to the animals that lived on the earth and the birds who lived in the air. It read, I'm amazed at your superstition. You believe in something that has never happened anywhere in the world. Who inspired you with that nonsense that there is a sun in this world? It is glorified in your assemblies and guides your affairs, and you think it colors life, animates flora and fauna, shines through the darkness, sheds light, and renews time. No, there is only darkness in the world, so time is one, and any other such view is far-fetched nonsense, as is yours. Stupidity is the fertile mother of all other stupidity. It is everywhere you go. Light, day, ray, lightning, rainbow, truth. What foolishness! My dear friends, don't be silly. Throw off the yoke of superstition. Do not believe anything until you hold it in your hand. Believe me, life is not about seeing, but about feeling. Yours faithfully from the underworld, the Great Mole. Written on the 18th of April, 1774. Many animals and birds liked this letter, such as the owl and the owlets, the nightjar, the hoopoe, the kite, and others except for the eagle and falcon. This high-born dogma was welcomed by a bat who, when seeing the sons of the turtle dove and pigeon, tried to impart to them this magnificent philosophy. But one of the turtle dove's sons said, Our parents are better teachers than you. They gave birth to us in darkness, but we are born to live in the light. And the turtle dove added, I can't believe the poor fool. You told me before that there is no sun in the world, but I, having been born in dark days, today, on the day of the sun's return, saw in the morning the sunrise of the most beautiful eye in the world. And the stench that comes from the bat and from the hoopoe indicates that an evil spirit lives inside them. Moral Light and darkness corruption and eternity, faith and wickedness, make up the whole world and need each other. Let him who is darkness be darkness, and let the light be light. You will know them by their fruits. The Camel and the Deer African deer often feed on snakes. So, having eaten his fill and still thirsty from the poison that was inside him, the deer dashed faster than a bird at noon until he came to the water springs in the high mountains. There he saw a camel drinking muddy water in a stream. "'Why are you going in such a hurry, Mr. Stag?' the camel said. "'Drink with me from this stream.' The deer said that he did not enjoy drinking muddy water. Your kin is too pretentious. I muddy the water intentionally. For me, muddy water is sweeter. I believe it, said the deer, but I was born to drink the clearest water from a spring. This stream will bring me all the way to its source, so I will continue to follow it. Good health, Mr. Humpback. Moral the Bible 
is the source of all of life's bounties. The human stories and mundane names in them are akin to swamp and mud. This fountain of living water is like a whale releasing the secret water of immortality from its nostrils. Whoever is a camel drinks the mud and drowns in words without reaching the spring's source, while the deer runs to clear water. A word, a name, a sign, a path, a trail, a foot, a hoof, a term, these are the mortal gates leading to the sources of immortality. He who does not divide the words and signs into flesh and spirit cannot distinguish between two waters the beauty of heaven and dew. The Cuckoo and the Blackbird The cuckoo flew to the blackbird. Aren't you bored? asked the cuckoo. What are you doing? I'm singing, said the blackbird. Can't you see? I sing more often than you do, but I'm still bored. All you do, miss, is throw your eggs into someone else's nest and fly from place to place, eat, drink, and eat. In the meantime, I feed, care for, and teach my children. I make my work easier with a song. Moral There are many people who having abandoned their usual work, only want to sing, drink, and eat. In their idleness, they experience unbearable boredom more frequently than those who work hard. Singing, drinking, and eating aren't work, but just a tale of the main thing that is characteristic of us. And for those who eat, drink, and sing in order to be more willing to start working after a rest, it is much easier to drive away boredom because they're accustomed to working every day. As one proverb says, every day is a holiday for a good man. Our work is a source of joy. If someone does not enjoy his work, then of course he is neither a relative nor a loyal friend to work. It is likely he loves something else and yet is both restless and unhappy. But nothing is as sweet as working together for everyone's benefit. It is the search for the kingdom of God, which is the source, the light, and the salt of each individual act of work. The one who contributes his natural gift for a common benefit is the happiest. Only then is it real life. And now you can understand those words of Socrates. Worthless people live only to eat and drink. People of worth eat and drink only to live. Socrates was a prominent ancient Greek philosopher and Plato's teacher. The Dogs and the Wolf The shepherd Titia had two dogs, Lucon and Theridam, who were great friends. Both wild and domestic animals alike knew about these two friends. So the wolf, having heard about the dogs and sensing an opportunity, decided to make friends with them. Please love and honour me. My gentleman, the wolf said courteously, you can thank me when you consent to honour me, as I respectfully hope to be your third friend. Then he told them a lot about his famous and rich ancestors, about the fashionable sciences that he had mastered at his father's expense. But if, added the wolf, it is considered foolish to brag about the family and sciences in your hearts, then I hope that you will still accept me. I look like both of you, and I look like Mr. Theridam in voice and hair. After all, there is an old proverb which says, God leads the like to the like. I don't hide anything, 
My tail is a fox's. My eyes are the wolf's. Lucon replied that Titia was not like them at all, and that he was their third friend. He won't do anything without Theridam. Then Theridam said, You are like us in voice and hair, but your heart is far away from us. We keep the sheep, and are content with wool and milk, and you skin them and eat them instead of bread. And most of all, we do not like the mirror of your soul, your evil eyes, which look hungrily at a close lamb. Moral No family, wealth, rank, kinship, physical gifts, or sciences are able to establish a friendship. Being joined in heart, mind, and sharing the same honesty of the human soul, that is true love and unity. The Mole and the Lynx According to fairy tales, the lynx has such a sharp eye that it sees through the ground for several yards below. One day, one such beast saw a mole in the soil and began mocking his blindness. Pathetic creature! If you had even a hundredth of my insight, you could have penetrated the very centre of the earth. Yet you have to navigate by your touch. You're as blind as the dark night. Stop being arrogant, the mole replied. Your vision is sharp, but your mind is completely blind. You may have been blessed with something I don't have, but I also have something that you lack. When you think about your sharp vision, don't forget about my sharp hearing. I would have developed eyes long ago if I needed them. The eternal truth of blissful nature does not offend anyone. When it made an equal inequality in everything, it took the heightened senses of the eyes and added them to the power of my hearing. Moral Stupidity in wealth manifests as pride and ridicule, and in poverty it manifests as despair. It is unhappy in both fates. Here it becomes enraged, and there it falls off its feet like a maimed beast. And all this pain is caused by the fact that they have not learned the kingdom of God and his truth, but they believe that everything in the world happens at random. But open your eyes, O oh poor creature, then you will see that everything happens according to the exact truth, and this stymies your fears. If there is something in wealth that is lacking in poverty, think, and you will find something in poverty that is lacking in wealth. A land that produces fewer fruits has cleaner air in its turn. Where there are more cranberries and blueberries, there is less scurvy. Fewer doctors, fewer patients, less gold, fewer needs, fewer hobbies, less squandering, less science, fewer fools, fewer rights, fewer wrongdoers, fewer weapons, fewer wars, fewer chefs, less spoiled food, less honour, less fear, less fun, less sadness, less glory, less disgrace, fewer friends, fewer enemies, less health, less passion. Each time, each country, all people, cities and villages, the youth and the elderly, sickness and health, death and life, night and day, winter and summer, every condition, gender and age, every creation has its own advantages. But blind stupidity and irrational disbelief cannot understand this. Blind stupidity sees only one evil thing in everything. So it raises time above the other time, puts one person above the other, 
dissatisfied with its condition, its country, its age, its kinship, its fate, its illness, its health, its death, its life, its old age, its youth, its summer, its winter, its night, and its day. The Lion and the Monkeys A lion sleeps on its back and, when it sleeps, looks very much like a dead lion. And when one such lion was sleeping, a crowd of monkeys, considering him dead, approached him. At first, they began to celebrate and mock, forgetting their fear and respect towards their king. When it was time to wake up from his sleep, the lion stirred. Then the monkeys that came to him from one direction scattered in seven ways, and the oldest of them, when she came to her senses, said, our ancestors hated the lion, and the lion is still the lion, and he will be for ever and ever. Moral The lion is symbolic of the Bible, which is rebelled against and persecuted by idol worshippers. They think that the Bible is dead and talk about the death of the scripture and of God, not realizing that eternal life is hidden in its mortal symbols. The Pike and the Crayfish The pike, having come across the sweet food, greedily swallowed it. Suddenly she felt a fishing hook hidden in the treat, which caught the inside of her mouth. The crayfish noticed this from afar and asked the pike, Dear lady, why are you so sad? Where did your courage go? I don't know, brother. I'm just sad. I think, to have fun, I should swim from Kremenchuk to the Danube. I'm fed up with Dnipro. I know the reason for your sadness, the crayfish said. You swallowed a fishing hook. Now... Neither the fast Danube, nor the fruit-bearing Nile, nor the cheerful Menderes will help you, not even will golden wings. Moral The crayfish tells the truth. Without God, living beyond the sea is a disaster. But for the wise person, the whole world is home. Everywhere and always, this person will feel good. Such a person feels no need to collect trinkets from their travels, but carries a part of those places inside himself, wherever he goes. It is like the sun, which at all times is a treasure in all parts of the world. THE BEE AND THE HORNET Tell me, bee, why are you so stupid? You know that the fruits of your labour are not as useful to you as they are to people. Also, you are often harmed finding death instead of reward, but you cannot foolishly collect honey. You have a lot of heads, but everyone is brainless. You must be really in love with honey. You're a big fool, Mr. Counselor, the bee said. The bear also likes to eat honey, and the hornet also gets it slyly. And we could steal honey, as our brethren sometimes do, if we only liked to eat it. But it is much more fun for us to collect honey than to eat it. That's why we're born to do it, and we'll do it until we're too old. And without this, even living in an abundance of honey is the worst death for us. Moral The hornet is an image of people who live by stealing someone else's property and only eat, drink, and do little else. And the bee is the wise person who does what he is naturally gifted at. Many hornets stupidly say, why, for example, does this student study but keep nothing for themselves? Why study when no such prosperity awaits you? 
but ask your greyhound. What is the most fun? And he will tell you, when I'm hunting a hare. You ask, when does the hare taste better? And the hunter will answer, when I'm hunting. Look at the cat sitting in front of you. When is he more cheerful? When he wanders around all night, or sits near a burrow, even though he catches mice and doesn't eat them? Lock up a bee in abundance. Won't it die of boredom at a time when it can fly in flower, giving birth to meadows? What is worse than swimming in abundance and suffering without practising your natural occupation? There is no worse torment than to be sick with thoughts. But thoughts are sick when people do not exploit their natural gifts. Indeed, there is no greater joy than to live by your nature. The Doe and the Wild Boar In the Polish and Hungarian mountains, a doe once met her friend, the boar. Good health to you, Mr. Boar, she greeted. I'm glad you're here. Why are you so naughty, you scoundrel? The boar shouted, puffing. How dare you call me a boar? Don't you know that I was raised as a sheep? I have a patent for it. My family is descended from the noblest beavers, and instead of a cloak I wear in public as I should, I wear the skin of a sheep. Forgive me said the doe. I did not know of this. We ordinary deer judge not by our clothes and words, but by our deeds. And you, as before, dig the ground and break the fences. God grant you to become a horse. Moral There are enough of those fools who despised and trampled on the best and most priceless beads of virtue just to break through to a rank that is not at all typical of them. What did the serpent whisper in their ears? That their new names and clothing would turn their nature away and lead them astray from an honest, worthy life. The community was like the ship which apes dressed in human clothes sailed, but none of them knew how to sail. If anyone has keen eyes, they would see many of these lion-skinned donkeys. Why are they dressed so? So that they can more freely satisfy people's slavish whims, disturb others, and break through the fences of civil laws. None are as guilty of dishonesty as these monkeys and donkeys and wild boars. A monkey is a monkey, even if it's wearing gold medals. There is also a proverb in Ukraine, a pig will never be a horse. The Old Lady and the Potter Once an old lady remembered the pleasures of her young years when she had bought some pots. How much for this pretty one? I'll take at least three half steps for that one, said the potter. And for that bad one over there, probably half a step? I won't take less than two kopecks for that. Why? That's weird. Oh, my lady, said the master, we do not choose things with our eyes. We're listening to see if it's ringing. Although the lady had good taste, she could not afford more, but only said that she herself had known about it for a long time, but had forgotten all about it. Moral Of course, the wise Eve is the great-grandmother of all those relatives who value a person by their clothes, body, money, and name, but not by the fruits of their life. As the Romans used to say, a pure, white, unenvious heart, merciful, patient, cheerful, transparent, reserved, peaceful, believing in God and relying on Him in everything, this is the pure ringing and the honest price of our soul.
the nightingale, the lark, and the thrush. In the middle of a step, there was a green garden where nightingales and thrushes lived. Once a lark flew to the nightingale. Hello, Mr. Singer, the lark said to him. Hello to you too, Mr. Nightingale, the singer replied. Why do you call me by your name? The lark asked. I am no nightingale. Then why do you call me a singer? The lark said, I called you a singer for a reason. Your name among the ancient Greeks was Ede, that is, singer, and Ode meant song. The nightingale said, And your name among the ancient Romans was Alorda, that is, glory, because Lordo means glory. The lark replied, if so, now I'm starting to love you even more, and I've come to ask for your friendship. The nightingale then exclaimed, Oh, simple mind, how can you ask for friendship? You have to be born for it. I often sing this song of mine, which I learned from my father. God leads the like to the like, the lark said. And my father sings this same song. I'm like you both in other ways and in this. All right, said the nightingale. I will be your sincere friend if you want to live in this garden. And I will be your sincere friend if you came with me to live in the steppe. Ah, don't drag me to the steppe. The steppe is death to me. How do you live in it? The lark replied, Ah, don't drag me into the garden. The garden is death to me. How do you live in it? Stop kidding, brothers, said a thrush sitting nearby. I see that you were born for friendship, but you don't understand love. Look not for what you like, but for what your friend likes, and then I'm ready to be your third friend. Thereafter, they each sang their own song and established eternal friendships under God. Moral These three birds represent sincere friendship. Friendship can neither be begged nor bought nor snatched by force. We love those whom we are born to love just as we eat what is natural to eat, and God has good food for everyone. And just as it is impossible to harness a horse alongside a bear or a dog alongside a wolf drawing a carriage, it is impossible not to tear off the old cloth sewn to the fresh one and unstick the rotten board from the new. The same disagreement exists between two people who have different morals, and the greatest unnatural bond is between an evil and a good heart. A lark can be friends with a thrush and a nightingale, but it can't be friends with a kite and a bat. If God has divided, then who will unite them? A wise and ancient proverb tells us, God leads the like to the like. The only thing a lark can't do is live in the garden, just as a nightingale can't live in the steppe. So don't force your friend to do something that makes you happy, but torments him. Two Cats A cat from the apiary came to the village to visit his old friend. A grand feast was waiting for him there. At the dinner table, he couldn't help marvelling at such wealth. God has given me a service, the host explained, and this service brings me a dozen or two of the best picked mice every day. I dare say that in the village I am called the great Cato. So I came to see you, the guest replied, to ask you if you live happily 
and if we could hunt together for fun. I hear you've got some good rats here. After dinner, they went to bed. But the host began to scream in his sleep and woke up the guest. You must have had some kind of nightmare. Oh, brother, it was as if I were drowning in the middle of the abyss. And I was hunting in my dream. I dreamed that I caught a real Siberian rat. The guest fell asleep again, slept well and woke up. Meanwhile, the owner was still sighing bitterly. Mr. Cato, did, did you sleep well? No, indeed. I didn't catch a wink of sleep after that nightmare. Really? Why not? I have such a nature that as soon as I wake up, I will not fall asleep again. And what is the reason for this? Oh, my friend, you probably don't know that I volunteer to be a fisherman for all the cats in the village, and I feel terribly sick as I remember the boat, the city, the water. Why did you go fishing? How else, brother? You can't live without food in this world. Moreover, I myself have a thing for fish. The guest shook his head. Oh, sir, he said, I don't know what you mean when you say God, but if you kept to your nature, which you are now vainly complaining about, you would be happy with a single fish for the whole day. Farewell to you and your happiness. My poverty is better. Then he got up and went back to the forest. Hence the saying, a dainty cat likes fish, but it is afraid of water. You have been listening to an Audible Studios production of Skovoroda's Fables, written by Gregory Skovoroda, narrated by Ben Onwukwe. English translation by Kings of Translation. Directed by Alison Holder. Casting by Anna Zidzik for PRL Studios. The production was recorded at Audible Studios. For Audible, the executive producer was Alice Hewer, and the commissioning editor was Harry Scoble. Copyright 2020 by Vivat Publications, LLC. Production copyright 2023 by Audible Limited. Audible Studios is a division of Audible Limited. <laughs>